Perfect. Yeah. Um, so I think we have about 20, 25 minutes. I, I know, I think, you know, I was going through the agenda of um, the conference and I think the topic I bring to the audience here is a little bit of, um, it doesn't have any keywords, I would say for, you know, like clinical trials, drug development and uh, patients. Uh, but I think what, what you see here is um, something at the back, what we are building is a world-class data science team within uh, <coughs> the modest ph pharmaceutical company and how we have been able to really um, build this team at scale, um, which I assume, you know, some of the organizations um, here would be going through that stage, uh, knowing that there's so much focus on how we can use AI um, in the early stage of research and development um, in a pharmaceutical world. So hopefully the session will be useful and um, I will um, encourage to, be, to, to make the session as interactive as possible. Um, to, so to start with, um, you know, I think my introduction, uh, you, you heard about, you know, where I come from. Um, I, as you see, I'm not necessarily from the pharmaceutical world. I joined pharmaceutical industry about five years back. Um, and primarily, I've been uh, focusing around how organizations and large enterprise can be can leverage AI and machine learning and deep learning, and a lot of the statistical uh, techniques to, um, to sh which can shape the business strategies um, and shape the business vision uh, and help them realize the investment in these um, big initiatives. Mm -hmm. But at the, at the same time, the core of all of this is. Um, to build the, the data science team or the analytics team at scale. Um, and I will share some of the learnings we have had in the past um, through the story of 5S, yeah? And um, I think the, the first key aspect of, you know, building the data science team, uh, which I encountered about five years back was, where do we really start, uh, right? What kind of skills we start hiring um, you know, in, in a large enterprise at us, uh, which is lo really looking, which at, um, looking for us to make an impact. And I think if, what you see on the right is a very uh, famous Venn diagram. Um, you know, when people say, what is a data scientist? You know, typically people flash this, where it says that it's amalgamation of uh, statistical algorithmic skills, plus hacking and coding skills and um, you know, storytelling and subject matter expertise, you know, a unicorn, if you will. Um, and we know that unicorns don't exist in reality, right? So I think that was the challenge we had when we were starting and building this team. Um, and one thing we realized as, you know, typically the business um, comes to us to solve their problems, uh, not because we have subject knowledge, uh, which they already have. The, what they don't have is the key tech skills, so when we started hiring um, and uh, you know trying to build the capability within uh, our enterprise, we start focusing more more on the bottom two uh, parts of the uh, Venn diagram, right? So we started hiring people who had more hacking and coding skills and who were really expert in uh, algorithmic design, who can architecturally design complex algorithms, um, and help us enable to scale those problems. Um, and I think, you know, the one thing which really worked uh, for us was, um, you know, when you look at the resumes of a lot of the people who apply for such positions, I, you really don't know which, which is a noise and what is a signal, right? Um, and one of the things which worked for us was really rolling out these data challenges. So I, I would say, I think we have so far um, rolled out um, data challenges for those positions, um, you know, five geographies, right? Uh, in, in, or I would say almost all the continents. Um, and we have seen that the data challenges, after we put the data challenge to the candidates, we see about 10 is to one ratio, right? So for 10, every 10 candidates whom we give the data challenge, only one candidate really um, makes an attempt. So that was really helped us to make sure that we first of all get the right people on board with the right skills, plus also with the right temperament and right passion to join uh, our organization. Um, and I think the, the other dilemma also when you're starting um, um, such teams is, do we need to have data science federated versus centralized? Uh, which I mean uh, is, do we need these skills to be embedded within the business 
or you want this to be a centralized service with a, with a large enterprise. And I think if when you're, um, it also depends on how big your enterprise is. But for us, it was a very genuine question. And where uh, we went uh, um, with a hybrid model, if you will, right? So we have um, in a data science capabilities embedded within business, be it clinical, drug development, be it research or other parts of the function. And as well as we have centralized skills. And I think the, the reason uh, for us to do was primarily where, where you need agility, um, where you need deep functional expertise, plus you need to trial and test a lot of ideas. It's better to have data scientists embedded within the business. Uh, but when you want to really standardize and scale uh, and knowing the talent of such talent is really scarce, you want to centralize these skills as well. So, you know, for a lot of the proof of value and prototyping, we had federated this model, but then for to scale and really make enable us to make an impact um, in some of the work we do, we also have centralized these skills. Yeah. Uh, and what I'm leading in uh, Novartis, for example, right now is the centralized data science services. Yeah. And I'll give you some of the reflections from uh, that journey. Okay. So uh, moving to the ne next is right, the setting the problem, right? So now we have identified uh, where to start, what kind of people to hire. Now the key question, which you know typically I was dealt with was how to really organizationally set your teams, right? Should it be focused towards you know function where I build SMEs around the functions, be it drug development, be it research, be it uh, manufacturing, be it uh, commercial launches, and other related functions, or we focus more on the tech skills like natural language processing, computer vision, um, explainable AI, um, and so on and so forth. And why? Because you know, as you see that you know, we were, even though we were hiring for tech skills, but when you go to business and um, you know help them solve the problem, they will always ask you, "Do you ha have you ever solved this problem before?" Which means that you need to have and functional skills as well. Um, but I think, you know, and I will show you in the next uh, piece where, how did we tackle the challenge? And also, um, you know, the key aspect for us was once we identify these, um, this journey, what are the right technical skills we need to really focus on? And we, we really invest our time and scale those skills because these, the, the pace of change in AI and deep learning and machine learning is really extensively huge. And for us to really um, not be at a catch-up position every time, we have to structurally and strategically design our organization so we are staying always ahead of the curve. And to do that, um, I think we followed certain principles where we looked at you know different the nature of different problems which comes to us, right? And you would see um, you know all of you being really expert in the pharmaceutical world our industry is really rich in unstructured information, right? So I have, as you heard from Dr. Jeffrey, I worked with Procter & Gamble. I've worked in a banking industry. I've even worked in a McDonald's. Uh, um, I think the key aspect of our industry is we're really, really rich in unstructured data. Um, and, the, and, the, that, uh, and that area, even in the data science and machine learning space is not, not very developed. It's underdeveloped. And where it is developed is, is, is really developed in the, the tech space, right? With Microsoft and Amazon and uh, Facebook and so on and so forth, but not in the real uh, industry where pe people are manufacturing and producing real products for the customers. So I think, you know, the first logic for us was, you know, we looked within, you know, what kind of problems we typically solve, where we need to really be continuously driving innovation, which is you see in the first lever, right? So we said, you know, we need to have teams dedicated to, natural language and vision. Um, and and I, I'm sure I don't need to educate you where these problems are being solved, right? Um, and then the other aspects was because a lot of these models are now black box models. Uh, you would have heard this term. Uh, we wanted to also invest time in explainable AI, right? I think how to unbox the black model where we can um, educate business around causality versus correlation, um, really explain to business around um, what they can really cho choose or do to really change the, the predictions which these models are giving. So we have created these teams around explainable AI and also this auto ML, right? So I think because of, as the problems are getting complex, the algorithms uh, are also getting huge in terms of what we can really leverage. So the, uh, we also build the team around auto, auto ML, right? Where 
you know, there, there are teams who are constantly looking out to see what new algorithms are coming um, and helping us to really automate and leverage those al algorithms at scale. And the third aspect is software engineering. And as I said, you know, we, we are a centralized service where we are scaling AI solutions across a company. Um, and which requires a very different mindset versus a proof of value and prototyping mindset. Um, and that's where, you know, when you scale a small solution to big scale, you also need computer science, software engineering skills. So at the same, we also have a dedicated arm within the team who who's constantly looking at how to optimize the algorithms, how to um, refactor the algorithms when you move want to move from one therapeutic area to 10 therapeutic areas from one geography to many geographies from thousand patients to million patients and so on and so forth. Um, and at the same time, the other aspect is of the data science platforms, right? So in Novartis, for example, we have about 600 to 700 data scientists and everybody has their own requirements and way of looking things. Um, so we have also have a team which constantly looks out for how we can really help the different data science communities to uh, make their work more efficient and uh, enriching. And, um, and you, have, you would have heard about a lot of open source and commercial data science platforms. So we are the voice of the internal data scientists team to really understand the capabilities and become an SME around these uh, data science platforms. Um, and I will not give the names, I think, just so that uh, we don't sway the discussion there. But it seems like there's a question. Um, and I think I will probably take the question in the end, Dr. Jeffrey. Yeah. That's fine. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that, sorry. Okay. So the, the third aspect of, you know, building and growing the team was um, also around how you make sure you build the right career path for the team. And uh, mind you, I think, you know, when I speak, I'm not speaking as a pure HR, right? So I'm a practitioner and data scientist but I have also built the team. So I'm, I think one thing definitely which has worked for me also um, is that you know, me being a manager and you know, building this team at the scratch, uh, plus also which me bringing the, the data science skills has helped me to empathize with the team we have, right? Because a lot of the, a lot of the time these people we are hired, they are the best in the industry, right? So everybody is vying for them. And we have to we have to really find a way to you know keep on in, uh, motivating and uh, encouraging them to really do the path breaking innovation. But I think just going back to this topic, step three, right? Stepping to grow. I think the the key challenge for me now was you know I've we have hired people, we have the um, you know the the sort of a uh, function set up in terms of how we want to organize ourselves. But the, then how do we make sure that the people are motivated to really constantly innovate and uh, see a value to stay with Novartis for long term, right? Um, and and I think I, I give you an example of one of the conference I was attending on ICML in Vancouver uh, just last year. Um, and there was a stall, right, where we were where Novartis had a stall to hire data scientists. And at the same time, we had all the tech giants, um, you know, all the fang, um, you know, all the fangs, if you will. And when we looked at some of the the designations, the title uh, which they were hiring were, you know, a very wide, wide variety of and diverse you know, titles, right? So I would, for example, they were hiring for machine learning engineers, machine learning scientists, uh, data scientists, data engineers, natural language engineers. So I think the, the key for me, the question is, you know, again, what title also you need to give to these people and how do they grow to the organization? Um, and I, I think there are many reasons you will see that there are different flavors of data scientists in some of the title. Uh, primarily because uh, in most of these large enterprises, these uh, data science is federated. So to distinguish themselves, you know, some of the some of the teams internally hire and give a different title. At the same time, I think because data scientists is also becoming very cliche term, uh, and people want to distinguish and make it a little bit more jazzy for people from Stanford, Harvard, and Cornell best universities to join you you know, by really spicing up these titles. Um, I think I'm just being very candid, what I've seen. Um, but I think what we have done in Novartis is, you know, among all of this noise, we have a very uh, um, straightforward uh, way of, you know, hiring and designing the career path. So this is on the left, you see the same Venn diagram in a little bit more Novartis context. Um, 
where you have the B, C, D from the you know the prior slide, and A I have just added more also from education, because what we have realized is you need to have diversity in your team. You cannot have only mathematical and computer scientists in your team. You also need biostatistician. You also need people from OR. You also need people from physics because they bring different analytical mindset. Um, so I think what we have done in the team, you will see, is you know different roles we have defined. You know, from uh, principal data scientists to senior data scientists and uh, mid-level to junior data scientists, which has a combination of these skills. One of the things we have followed is we don't hire. At least I don't hire any principal data scientists. I want people to grow from within. So and I think so. There's an opportunity to grow. At the same time, we maintain a, a sort of a pyramid structure where there is a constant ratio of a senior data scientist versus junior data scientist, right? Because uh, so everybody sees an opportunity for growth. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, one thing we need to emphasize uh, beyond data science to make these projects successful, you also need a equally good business counterpart, which is where the A and B skills really come into play. Uh, like a business translator and business leader, people who have quant skills, but they would have not, you know, be a hands-on data scientist, coder, programmer, but they can empathize with what, you know, uh, the data scientists bring. At the same time, they understand the business better. So they can bring, uh, they can uh, be a bridge uh, between the business problems and the data science community to help us prioritize to solve the right business problem. Yeah. The, uh, the other aspect of the four, um, the S is the sharing, right? As I said, you know, a lot of the time, these people are very individualistic also because they come from the top colleges. They know they are, everybody is vying for them. Um, I think how to make sure that they collaboratively work together um, in a large enterprise, not only among themselves, but also with the diverse data science team. And I think we have, we have created the right environment for them to experiment and innovate by, um, you know, creating sort of, you know, I would say simple things like reading groups, right, where data scientists um, have, a, uh, we have a community of practice, where data scientists read research papers, share research papers, we have created uh, model libraries where people can use model, and there is an incentive to share their models. Um, and they have KPIs, which we measure them, that how much of these assets they are creating within enterprise, which are being used. Um, by other data scientists community. We have also make sure that um, we also do an outside in approach, right? We make sure we talk to vendors, we talk to other experts within different communities and bring the outside in perspective for us to uh, not be lost behind, yeah? And then also as an enterprise, we have a tie up with Coursera and LinkedIn uh, where we have all the courses made available to our data scientist community to we constantly train and retrain um, as we scale uh, and we solve more complex problems. Yeah. And the last but not the least, um, scaling to win, right? So I think once we have the, the team, the key success mantra for this team to continuously stay an impactful and in large enterprises to make sure we build solutions which our data, which the business is able to use and leverage in their work processes. And what you see on the right is, you know, one of the surveys done by McKinsey, um, where they found, where they try to understand how many of the different industries are using AI, um, and then how much of those are really penetrated into the business processes. And as you see, in only 3% of the organizations overall are really leveraging AI um, beyond just the proof of value and prototyping. And healthcare industry and pharmaceutical industry is no very different. Um, and therefore, I think the key thing which we make sure uh, we constantly um, work is to make sure we build scalable products for, for our consumers, which are able to use uh, beyond just prototyping. Uh, we have success measures where we, we want to see that how many of the products we are releasing, we have more releases of those products. We have a KPI where we measure how many of the same customers are coming back to us with new problems to be solved. And we are also having, uh, we are also making sure that um, we're also measuring the hard and the soft benefits to some of the interventions we are doing um, and embedding this AI into the business processes. 
So I think I will stop here. Um, I think that's the story I had, um, and I'll give uh, time for question and answer and interaction from here on. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nimit, for your presentation. And we do have a question, or more so of a comment for you from an attendee. Um, and this person is saying, in the EU European Union, there is GDPR, so it makes it much more challenging. Yeah, exactly. So I think you know what we have done is um, we we are a global team, right? So we have um, um, we're working. We have teams which are dedicated to geography to make sure that if there are any data privacy issues in US and in Europe, we don't um, we are able to really work in that silo, right? Uh, if you will. Um, but from a skill standpoint, we also still make sure that we are able to share the skills and the learnings, if not the model and the team. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think uh, you're right. I think we have what we have done is we have like, for example, you know, five pockets of uh, innovation uh, hubs in across geography. We have in US, we have in two in Europe and uh, two in Asia, where we make sure that these pockets are self-sustainable uh, if you want to. But then we also bring synergies in terms of the learnings cross projects. Um, I think if I remember from your introduction, it mentioned drug manufacturing as one area that you're focusing on. Can you share the kinds of um, issues or questions that you're addressing this data analysis to in, in the manufacturing arena? Right. I, I think in, in manufacturing, um, you know, there are many problems we are trying to solve. You know, first, you know, we are trying to build um, a control tower concept uh, in manufacturing where so, you know, we have about 70 plus sites cross world, right? So the idea is through using this control tower concept, which you see in an airplane a airline industry, mm -hmm. can we visualize where, you know, we are, uh, where we are more, we have more stock, where we have less stock, uh, what is the amount of inventory we are holding in each of these uh, locations um, and where we see the synergies cross geography, right? Cross geography sites. So we are trying to use this con uh, control tower concept and the, at the back, we are trying to embed these data science and AI driven insights uh, so that, you know, we, we are more proactive versus reactive. Um, and I think we also do a lot, lot of more operational problems in this context. Like, you know, can we predict, for example, the failure of the machines, right? If, because if you're uh, uh, manufacturing any biotech product and your machine goes down, you might lose a lot of API um, and which could be worth millions, right? So how can we really be more predictive in predicting the failures of the machine for some of our critical products? That's fascinating. Thank you. Thank you again, Nimit. Um, and like we mentioned, I believe your slide deck is available with us. So if anybody's interested, um, you could definitely share that. Perfect. Yep. Thank you.